Anyone want, we're going to start this with a prayer, and anybody that wants to participate, that's fine. And if you don't, that's fine too. Hello. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you for allowing us to be here tonight, Lord, together, to be able to talk and discuss the things that confront us. Lord, we pray that you guide everything that we do here, Lord. Pray that you show us what needs to be done to be best for the people, Lord. We just pray that you guide us, lead us, direct us this, this evening. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. And for y'all that don't know, this is Andrea's father, Andrea Kennedy's father, Gary. And Andrea is our uh, track co-chair, and she is a an asset that can't be lived with, an asset that cannot be lived without. <laughs> and uh, her daddy is her, her uh, captain of her fan club. <laughs> and a wonderful way I said to you. Uh, thank you all for coming. I know there's a whole bunch of stuff going on, and I appreciate what it is to give up a few minutes and come and, and talk and, and meet about things. I, I am so grateful. Thank you so much. Uh, there's a whole lot of folks that could not be here tonight that are very important to some of the things that we're talking about. Uh, first and foremost, I wanted to mention our, our county judge executive, Mr. Tucker Daniel who is uh, here in Johnson County, a huge supporter of Trail Town and the Kentucky Mountain Regional Recreation Authority and anything and everything to do with furthering and bettering our communities and our region. Um, he's not feeling well this evening uh, and really needed to be at home. But I wanted y'all to know what a, a staunch supporter he is of this and how appreciative he is of everyone that's participating in this, every community up and down the river. Uh, and away from the river too, I don't believe anybody else. <laughs> uh, part of the, one of the reasons we're here tonight is something super, super exciting is going on and it has to do with this document right here. This is an interlocal agreement on the Blue Water Trail and we're calling the Blue Water Trail the Chattawa Trace Trail. And for those of you that have lived, who's lived here all your life? All your life growing up, what'd you call that river that runs down through here? Big Sandy. Big Sandy. <laughs> and you're not alone. Everybody that grew up anywhere along this river has called that river Big Sandy. That river technically is called the Leviza Ford. And to be even more technical than that, that was a bastardation of the first European name given to it, which was Louisa Ford. But before that, Native American people lived here for many, 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 many more moons than we now have been here, and they called it the Chatterworth. And that was Shining Banks. And they used it for thousands of years to travel, to hunt, to move things, move people. And uh, so when we got to talking about this river trail, what were we going to call it? Louisa, Leviza Fork. Uh, the Russell Fork that runs into the Leviza Fork that runs into the Big Sandy. You know, what were we going to call this one entity that we're trying to promote? And when we talked about it, we came up with the idea to just go back to its original name. And then, you know, you have the, the components. We have the Russell Fork and, and the Leviza and the Tug and the Big Sandy all together. And our part we're calling the Chattawa Trace. Pretty exciting. Now, we don't have a board to put it on, but uh, this is the product of a lot of people, a lot of people working in synergy with each other, and particularly in local governments. The local government agreement is signed by everyone from Elkhorn City to Catlettsburg. That is a huge, yeah. huge thing. Anybody ever heard of local governments getting along regularly? <laughs> Sometimes. Not this region. <laughs> Not this region, exactly. Sometimes in our history, and more often than is, has been good for us, they have not gotten along for whatever reason. Sometimes it was just uh, political things, party things, you know, things that really didn't make any difference. We have reached an apex in our economic planning of our region in a post-coal economy, we now realize, all of us realize, that individually, we are not gonna stand alone 
and have a significant impact, one that's significant enough to carry our economy. But together, and if you'll look at the top of this map up here, at the county shaded there, those counties are the ones that have signed resolutions that are involved in this agreement to promote this river because it, it's for our own benefit, it's for our good to grow our economy. This is the entire, just about the entire Eastern Kentucky region. Who's the white spot? I'm not going to say because we're going to keep it positive. <laughs> so the impact of this is tremendous. I'm going to lay this up here and you all are, are welcome to look at it any time. The impact of having a 164 mile river trail that is endorsed by the Kentucky Fish and Wildlife, that's endorsed by uh, Kentucky Tourism, both regular tourism and adventure outdoor tourism, uh, and every local government whose lands touch that river is tremendous. Now, when we have, uh, when we're promoting that, we're promoting that as a region, and we have much more resources than each of us would have individually to do that. Uh, how much fun would it be to go to a, a kayaking thing where you got to kayak two miles and that was the end of the story? Yeah. Not much fun. <laughs> Not much fun. But when you get uh, tourists here and they can get on the river, and these guys back here can attest to this. Uh, these are our, our in-house river rats tonight. Uh, when you can get on the river and, and achieve some distance, you're going to stay in that area for a little while. Makes all the difference. Huh? It makes all the difference. It makes all the difference. Now we're, we're going to be able to capture a market that's not just for a day. Maybe it's for a week. Maybe it's for two weeks. They're going to spend in our region traveling down this waterway, fishing, uh, stopping in the towns, enjoying what they have to offer. You know, uh, the economic impact is huge. And it's because of these local government leaders having enough vision to understand that working as a team is so much more effective than working against each other. And uh, I'm very, very pleased to, to tell you all that we have all but two of the signatures needed to complete the entire interlocal agreement for the entire waterway. Wow. And that includes West Virginia, and we're in the works to include Virginia where the actual headwaters are. So that's 164 miles of trail and a ton of potential. And we're doing it in synergy with the Tug Fork, uh, who is also, the Friends of the Tug are also doing their Blue Water Trail. When this is completed, and, and I'll let uh, our speaker tell you more about that, we will have a, an entire river system just about that is designated as trails. That is a, that is a tremendous thing. It's a, when you hear people talking about low hanging fruit, anybody ever heard that terminology? That's the stuff that's easily got. That's the stuff you don't have to build, you don't have to create. We didn't create this river, honey. The good Lord did a long, long time ago. Amen. And uh, But it's ours to enjoy. It's ours to promote. It's ours to uh, to encourage folks, other folks to come and enjoy. So it's huge. This thing that we're doing is super, super huge. Mayor, thank you. Thank you You're so welcome. much for being supportive. You're welcome. I can't thank you enough for being supportive of this. Um, we have a, a guest speaker, and this is Lee McClellan, and Lee is with Kentucky Fish and Wildlife, and he's going to tell you more about this, and he brought you all some magazines. Awesome. Put my stuff up here, and I'll pass that. Okay, you do your thing, then. Do you need anything? No, Okay. A better brain, but, you know, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably all around the possibility.
Oh, man, love, I'm going to be a Also, uh, if anyone, I just brought some copies of our recent winter issue. Just y'all can grab, pick these up, or you can grab them as you will. Also, uh, I brought everybody one of our calendars, even though it is getting into March. It has all the hunting seasons, um, tips, outdoor tips, fishing tips, hunting tips, uh, nature tips, and not. So. All right. Laura asked me to come and speak mainly about what we're doing. I won't be too long. What we're doing about um, getting more access to our strengths. That is the limiting factor in this whole deal. Um, canoeing and kayaking is exploding. Um, it's one of the fastest growing aspects of anything in the outdoors. A lot of people are non-consumptive users. You know, they don't fish while they're going. Um, they just want to paddle. They just want to sightsee and to get out and get some exercise, some fresh air, and just enjoy the beauty of being on a stream. A river is, is a unique ecosystem. It's all it's so much different. It's real. It has a lot more life. It has a lot more vibrancy. And just being on a river is just an incredible feeling. And people are turning into that. And kayaks are you know, they're affordable. Um, bass boats and all have gotten so outlandishly expensive that it's priced a lot of middle class people like me out of the market. I mean, and that's also forced all the used boats to get more expensive because when the, when the new ones get more expensive that drives the price up of the used. So I mean it's just a lot of people can't can't do that. So a nice, you can get a really nice top of the line kayak for you know, under fifteen hundred dollars. You can get a basic one for, for around five hundred or less. Um, and then you could be out paddling. So that appeals to a lot of people. So, uh, and they require no maintenance other than you need to put a little protectant on it every once in a while. And um, they, don't, they don't burn any gas. So you burn calories instead of burning fossil fuels, which appeals to a lot of people. But one of the things we've done is over the last year, we've launched a canoeing and kayaking page on our website at fw.ky.gov. Uh, any of you have there? It's all over the, the materials I gave to you. And what it does is it's compiling all the important stuff that you need um, to, to go have a successful outing. Um, we have a list of where to boat in Kentucky. You can select by, you go and click on that. And you can select by type of ramp, carry down. Um, you can select by water body, county city um, and you can select all these parameters and you can find out all the like you know go on there uh levisa fork bam all the ones that we know about and when we have new access we're trying to outreach <coughs> people like you all to let us know hey this is an access and we have a stream biologist and that's his job is to go around and work with counties work with cities and work with government entities to say hey you know i know people fish here can we make that an official access and we'll put it on our website that people can use? And most of most, most of the time they're very like, yeah, yes. Uh, they're very, sometimes they're standoffish, but usually they're yes because that's money coming into the community. So um, it, it includes uh, carry down access, bank access, um, and, and you can select by access type if you just want to use carry downs for your kayak. So uh, it comes in real handy. In that page, we also have a stream fisheries page, which is something new we're doing. Uh, we've profiled uh, 10 streams, um, and we're, going, we're working our way east. Kenny Kinnick is, is we're at South Fork Kentucky River is on there. And it has a wealth of information. You click on that, 
It has the accesses, it has the mileages between the accesses, which is vitally important. And another thing that I love, it has a picture of the access. So when you're new on the screen, there's nothing scarier than, oh God, it's getting 7.30, I can't see. Where in the world's the access? I've never been here before. <laughs> then you start getting that, have I blown by it? Oh my God, you know, that's a panic feeling when it's getting dark and you're not at the access and you're starting to freak out a little bit thinking, was I farting around looking at a bird, blew right by it? Or, you know, I don't, you know, and I've been there. I've dark floated many a times and the worst thing in the world is dark floating. It is absolutely the worst. You can't tell how deep it is even with a flashlight. It'll look three feet deep, you step off, it's up to your neck. Uh, it's just no good. And it's hard to find accesses unless you have a really good flashlight. You'll just go right by when it gets dark. So having a picture of what it looks like is invaluable. Also, they've profiled, and they're adding on the stream. They're adding several every year. It's going to grow and grow and grow. And they go and they sample the streams for populations of rock bass, small mouse, muscalunge, whatever the, the predominant predator species are in that stream. You can look down and say, oh, they shot up several over 17 inches, you know, some over 16. It'll give you frequency and it'll give you length. And it gives you an idea of how healthy that population is, which is handy. Also, it has links to the USGS uh, water flow stream table, which is invaluable. How many of you have used this when you plan a trip? Me. Yeah. I mean, you, you, need, you need to put it on your favorites if you, if you mm -hmm. get into canoeing and kayaking because it instantly tells you if it's blown out because it has a, um, an average over the years and a mean, and I'll give you an idea, and it has these little triangles on it. If it's way up here, the triangles are way down there, then you know to not waste your time and drive an hour because it's going to be blown out and chop a milk and not not really very paddleable and, and, and not very fishable at all. Uh, muddy water in a stream is the most difficult. Cold muddy water in a stream is really difficult fishing. So, um, man, why are you making it? I bet the red one was like, She was on the wrong page. <laughs> <laughs> So, and we also have information on there about uh, paddling safety. There's courses you can look and you can download those to, to promote safe paddling. I mean, paddling's fun, but if you don't know what you're doing and you don't know the river that well, you can get into some hairy situations sometimes. Um, you always want to keep your boat straight. You never ever want to be doing like this unless you're in a boat. But if you're in moving water, you want to keep that boat, that bow pointed downstream at all times. If you get crosswise, that's usually when you flip. Or if you're going fast and you hit something with the bow, avoid hitting stuff because that slows down, inertia carries your boat around, and flip, over you go. So fishing kayaks now are much more stable than they were 10 years ago. Um, and they're, they're much safer, but still, you know, flipping is no fun. Always, always, always wear that PFD. Even if it's hot, if, you know, always wear it. I wear mine all the time, and I cuss it because I'm hot, and it's the summer, and it's on a stream I know, but you never know. You know, if you, you get upset, and you hit your head. To give you an example, my wife and I, she's just gotten into kayaking. I bought a new kayak, now she has an old kayak, so we can go together. And we're, it's, it's a really good way to have a couple time, and, and it's fun, and we have a picnic, and all. Well, um, we were going through a pretty mild stretch of Elkhorn Creek there near Frankfurt, and uh, I heard it behind me, and I went, I turned around, I was like, how in the world did you flip in this? And, and a spider was <laughs> hanging spider. down from a tree, and she, <laughs> and just forgot for a moment, because she, I mean, she is deathly afraid of spiders. So she, um, she saw the spider, freaked out and just forgot for a minute that she was on a boat and tried to like get out and then over she went. We got everything back, broke a little bit of the handle off the rod, fishing rod I built her, but everything else we got back and, and I always assume you're going to flip because I have her clip down everything under, you know, in your tank well, clip everything down, put it in your front well if you're not using it, assume you're going to flip. That way when you do, if you do flip, you don't lose all your stuff. We didn't lose a thing. Except that she broke a little bit of the cork off her handle and I fixed that. And she didn't get spider bit. And she didn't get spider bit. <laughs> she got a little cold. Um, it was in October. But yeah, the spider, I was like, honey, you can never forget this duck. Just don't forget, you're, you're, you're on a boat. You're not home. <laughs> when we were first married, uh, I heard a blood-curdling scream coming from the bathroom. We were living in an apartment. Uh, 
We didn't have the two pennies rub together. And uh, now we have three pennies to rub together. <laughs> and I, I was like, I thought an axe murderer was in the house. You know, I was about running to get my pistol. And uh, it was a spider about the size of an ant that was in the shower. So that's when I got the introduction. She really hates spiders. We didn't live together until we got married, so I was kind of learning my way. She's not a fan of spiders. <coughs> so for her to freak a little bit and flip, kind of par for the course. Okay. So you have all those links. Um, and we're going we're gonna to keep adding to that stream fisheries page. And when, we, when our biologists do sampling and stuff, they're going to send it in. We're going to have our stream biologists come up and check it out. I'm sure this one will be... Tuck Fork will be on there pretty soon. The Vice will be on there pretty soon. But also contained in that is the series uh, of articles that I've written starting in 2010. I've been doing them eight years now. I can't believe that. I'm up to 34, and that's the Blue Water Trail series. And I used to send them out over email, but, you know, as administrations change and people change, now we're doing them in our magazine, and then I take a PDF and put that on the Blue Water Trail. So I have to have Obi. I, now the paddling season is getting ready to fire up. I need to have this, and it'll be on a PDF form that you can bring up free, print it off, and uh, and enjoy it. And um, 34 streams. I've done one on the Vice of Fork on the uh, the Hatfield McCoy paddling trail. I did that one with Sean Cocker, and I'm sure we all know Sean. He helped he helped me on that one. We did we did that piece. I also did one on uh, the Russell Fork. Which, you know, I also said bail at the garden hole in the upper part and put in a Ratliff hole at the bottom part. The other part, don't go. <laughs> That's your both, world class. Both the city government at Elkhorn City and Sean helped us to uh, develop the interlocal agreement to, mm -hmm. to work on our trails. And Cold Run Village, they uh, sent them their information as well. So they've been great partners on this. That's Sean's good. been very helpful. Mm -hmm. and, and, I mean... The Brakes Interstate Park, it's one of the unknown gems of it. I mean, that it really place is. is phenomenal. It is so gorgeous. Beautiful. When you're driving up there, and the drive up and the gorge that comes before you even get into the park is fabulous. I've got some on my phone I show people. It's like, where do you think that is? They, Colorado or, you know, <laughs> Wyoming. I was like, no, it's a Pike County. <laughs> it's awesome. But in the Blue Water Trails, what I try to do is one, the main thing is, I'm designing these for worry-free pack. Every access in here has been ground-proofed. I don't write, I go out and float it. I don't sit there and write, the, the canoeing and kayaking guy to Kentucky, great book, but he wrote that North Carolina looking at bridges. And he pretty much has every bridge and there is an access point. And half of his accesses are wrong. So if you use that book and you go there, you know, a lot of times the bridge is like super high and there's no way you can carry a boat down there. But it'll have a distance and access point. So he didn't, I, I, that always made me mad. So I wanted to make sure that these are worry-free articles that you can go. And I'm always, I've got a list this long. I've got a, now that it's fired up over the winter, I compile the changes I need to make because access has come, access has go. I try to keep it as updated as possible, okay? That way, when you go to that stream fisheries page and you see the blue water trails underneath or the canoe and kayaking page, right? you see the blue water trails underneath, that's bona fide. I have ground proof, and I wanted worry-free enjoyment of our incredible stream fisheries that I think have been neglected and overlooked for a long time. Um, we have tremendous resources here at Kentucky for streams. Another thing is we have, I always include, a map that has the distances, the access points, and everything so people can look at that map. And also the older versions I have have a printable map that we have our GIS people make uh, based on the Department of Transportation's grid, which is the most accurate in the state. So they'll look there, that stuff up on there, and then we'll have a printable map of that. But with the PDS, the map's kind of included. But the older ones I've done, you can print a map, and it has the same thing. It has distances, access points, and also in the narrative, the story that goes along with it. If there's a tricky part of the access, like, this road says it's blah, blah, but really you need to go another quarter mile and take a left on this road um, to make sure that you get to here. Or, you know, this road here is, is you know, doesn't go all the way to the stream. Go up to the next one. If I know there's something that's difficult that's going to make you users confused, I try to make sure I take care of that one there. I always try to add a little history to it. Um, and I also put 
fishing tips and fishing information for the, the species, mainly our streams are smallmouth bass streams, most of them. But if they're a muscadine stream or largemouths are more predominant, I get fishing techniques and, and tips on how to catch them because you know, th this is a paddling article, but I want to make sure I emphasize fishing because a lot of the paddling literature is just about paddling. It doesn't include the fishing aspect. And I also try to say, if you're fishing, you know, you look at those guidebooks, this is a three-hour paddle. Well, if you're fishing, that's a six-hour paddle. Okay? So anytime you know you're going to fish, double the time whatever the guidebook says. If it says it's a four-hour straight paddle, then plan on all day. So, and I, I include that in the narrative. Do you also, put nine-hour paddles for people like me that tie off and nap? Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Just don't want a dark flip. That's don't, dark, don't dark flip. But I mean, I pull over all the time. I love the beach and get out and wait, you know, yeah. and, and then have a sandwich and then, you know, and look and then I might spend an hour on one spot if it's good fishing. Um, so that can really add up to the time. Um, also, the maps denote power lines, low head dams, and anything you may have to, uh, you may have to portage, which you need to know. And Power lines are great because they give you an idea. Oh, here's the power line. Okay, we still have about two miles left according to this map after we cross into this power line. There's, they're great for keeping track of your time. That is a big challenge. And I still do it, and I know better. But you'll get to the pudding, you're so excited to be there, and you'll you'll piddle and fish and everything for the first mile and a half, and then you realize, I've got six more miles to go, and it's two o'clock in the afternoon. You know, So it's really hard to maintain discipline on keeping your boat moving which is I'm, everybody's bad about it because you're excited to be there but having those in the maps and stuff kind of helps you out. go to and keeps you moving and alleviates fear when you're like oh, we've been going a long time and I haven't seen it oh there's the power line oh good now I can relax I know I've got another mile and a half or whatever because that's a scary feeling when you're on a stream for the first time and since these are going to be all new accesses and trails People are going to need to know landmarks and stuff so they don't freak out. There's nothing scarier than time is getting away and you don't have any idea how far it is to, to the takeout. That is, that can induce panic. You know, that's a, that's a barrier sometimes to family. People go that, then they dark float and they hated it and that they sometimes don't come back. So it's very important to make sure everybody knows uh, the distances and the landmarks so you can gauge your trip accordingly. Especially we fishermen. Because if you're on them in a good hole, you'll stay two hours, and then seven o'clock, you're you're you still got a quarter of the way to go home, and you're panicking. So, I'm going to do one on the tug fork for the summer issue of our magazine, and it will be on the the uh, Blue Water Trails page, um, accordingly. And um, this is our basic layout too. Here's our map. We always have nice, pretty pictures. That was a nice small map. I wish Obi had it. I had other pictures of him holding that big small mouth there it looks like a minnow but you see his hand it's probably about 16 but doesn't look that way but it's a pretty picture he's he looks more aesthetically i look i want big fish you know <laughs> i want people to get excited he wants pretty pictures that have good composition i want big fish so we're always going back and forth um, that's the end of the narrows of the south fork and that is one of the best small mouth streams this south fork kentucky river we put in an onita and we took out a rocky branch easy shuttle gorgeous I mean, gorgeous. And we saw a couple of people. This this drop here is a little bit hairy. You need to shoot it in the middle. We all we portaged on the right because we didn't know him. The guy went right by us, right down the middle. I was like, well, we look like fools. Oh yeah, I mean, he went right. And he, he didn't have a really white water boat. <coughs> Straight down the middle. We were all over there <laughs> pulling and grunting and cussing, and he went right down the middle. So I prefer to paddle over portage. But sometimes, if you don't know, this is Danny Barrett. Anybody know Danny Barrett? He was the Upper Kentucky River manager for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. He retired about seven years ago. His sure. son Scott is the one holding that fish. I'm sure David knows him. He's, he's, a, he's a good guy. Uh, and another, the last thing that we're doing is we've, I'm on the Paddling Access Working Group. Now, Paul Wilkes is overseeing this because he has the federal money. We're trying to partner with county governments and city governments to, and we've got a model uh, schematic plan. We already have the costs, and it, they're gravel. They're you know a gravel parking area and a gravel uh, carry down. They're not boat ramps. They're carry downs, which are much cheaper. Boat ramps are expensive. And um, 
and, and, and what? And hairy to get. Yeah, they are. <laughs> um, you know, we've got a list this long of people. I mean, we have constant requests. And they are, after a flood, they all need maintenance, too, because the end will wash out and the tow breaks <coughs> off, then you got to go put a new slab in. And boats, boat ramps, keeping them are a pain in the butt. But you know, people love them because they work. But these will be more where we'll have um, so, some signage, we'll have parking, we'll have a gravel carry down that's easy, and we'll have it marked on our web page. Um, we've, we've had a little bit of an issue with, when administrations turn over, then the next county judge, executive, or whatnot, mayor, um, comes, and then is not on board. That fell through. There was one in, I think, Pike County that we were working on that fell through that way. That's back on the burner. So we want to do like five in the next year or two to, to show as a model to other governments, this is what we can do. And if you can match us with funding, we can come up with this. If you can come up with that, we can meet in the middle and increase our stream access, which is vitally important. It is and we're trying to eliminate those pseudo, what I call pseudo public accesses. Places that people have fished for a long time, but aren't technically public, but the landowner doesn't care. Th those I feel uncomfortable publishing. Because if you increase the volume greatly, the landowner might start caring, might start getting mad. Um, so I mean, there's a South Fork of Licking is terrible about that. The access is a crude. And they're quasi-public. So we want them, that's why we're working with county officials to say, hey, this is where we, is this an access that we can list as public that people can use on our website? And if they say no, we don't put it on it. Or they say, well, it's in, then we don't put it on it. We want bona fide ones that are, that are recognized by government officials. Yes, this is a public access spot. You can put this out for the public to consider. Because I don't want, I hate with those quasi-public. Oh, I've got fish down in Henry's place forever. He doesn't care. Well, that's fine, but you can't publish that publicly, you know, because Henry might get mad and just run everybody off, you know. So we want to make sure that we have worry-free access. That's what the, the paddling access group is doing, <coughs> is we're trying to get more access that's sanctioned, that's usable, that you don't have to worry about angering landowners when you're using it. And the last thing is the stream laws in Kentucky are really, really weird. In other states, it's usually to the high water mark, it's public. No one owns the water. As long as you're in your boat, a landowner can't say a thing because you're sitting upon water, which is the public domain. However, when you step out to wade, there's a good chance that you're trespassing. Most, 99% of the time, you're not going to have any problem. 1% of the time, you might. Now, a judge in Frankfurt over a uh, case involving Elkhorn Creek um, decided that waiting is an essential activity on the stream and the public can wait wherever they want on Elkhorn Creek because he deemed that an essential activity of the stream. I would love to see that take off as precedent for the rest of the state. That way you don't have issues. So, water, you're cool, feet on the bottom. Some of the old deeds don't uh, demarcate the bottom as being owned. Um, some just say to the water line here of such and such creek, and the bottom's kind of in the public domain. Others, you have to go to the courthouse and pull the, pull the black. Others, you know, the, the, the property line runs right down the middle or over on this side. So, you know, the older deeds tend to be more just using the stream bank. The newer deeds usually are the stream is included. So um, when people ask me, all oh, that's one of the biggest questions I get. What's the stream laws? Well, that's the stream law. Um, and it's complicated. So if it's an older deed and they don't care, then you're okay. But if it's a newer deed and they've demarcated it, then you're not. But most of the time you're fine if you wait and if you show respect. Now, another thing is most bridge abutments and around are a public easement that you can use as egress. That's why you have those little right of way. You've seen the little concrete things near bridges that, that mark the right of way. The right of way is the public domain. So most of those, you're, you're cool to access there. If it's feasible. A lot of bridges, this is not feasible. But um, that's another one I get a lot of questions about. Can I use a bridge as an access? A lot of times you can. But then again, this depends on the If it crosses just a little bit of private property, that landowner can say, get out. Most of the time that won't happen, but there's potential for it to happen. 
And I've had a, it on South Elkhorn there in Midway. I've had a farmer come out. He owns a bed and breakfast there with a uh, over and under broken over his forearm there in the crux of his. I don't allow fishing. I don't allow them. Like, Sir, sorry. He said, Down, downstream of the bridge, I don't care. You can't come up here. Not here to cause trouble. Have a good day. Uh, but that's the only time that's happened. And I, you know, I've written 34 articles on street fishing. I've snoozed around everywhere and snuck and looked. That's the only bad encounter I've had. Since college, I had a few in Silver Creek because people got their party and the landowner get mad. They like fire, they shoot guns, they get drunk. He didn't like that. <laughs> so, I, and I can understand. But since that time, that's the only time I've had a veiled threat issue to me about access. So, hmm. and I, I float probably as much as anybody in the state of Kentucky. I'm not bragging. I'm just saying I, I do it for my job and I do it for my recreation because I love it. It's fun. So, um, that that is the laws regarding that, and they're they're kind of gray and fluid. I would love to see legislation down the road that, that nails that down one, because as the as the paddle sports grow. Uh, there's potential for more conflicts along those lines. So that's why the, in the Blue Water Trails, I emphasize these are bona fide, bulletproof access spots that you don't have to worry at all about Farmer Joe coming down with a shotgun in the truck of his um, Any questions? What's our stream health uh, here locally on the Leviza? What's, improving, what's the health Improving thing? with each passing year. Most streams, uh, and Kevin Fry knows more about this than I do, but what I've what I've seen in, in East Kentucky streams, the further you get away from the impacts from coal, which you know, I mean, it has impact. <coughs> but as you get decades past, these streams are healing, especially the live, the vice fork above the lake. You should see the smallmouth they shocked up there. I mean. I meant to, I should have brought, put them on my phone. They're or tremendous. I should have brought them. Because they sent those men, like, where in the world's that? It's like the Levisa Fork above the Fish Trap Lake. I mean, 21, 22 inch smallmouth, fat, and they go up there in the spring. So, if you want to catch a smallmouth where the stream is still flowing, but it's almost in the lake, those mile above the stream, here in April, get out there and hit that. Because there are some fat hogs in there. And that whole part, all the way up. Um, and near the mouth guard, mm -hmm. near mouth guard, is, even though there was that little spill a couple of years ago, it didn't. Uh, Kevin Fry said that is one of the hottest smallmouth spots to fish as well in that section. So, but you could put your boat in a um, fish trap in the upper part and boat up and beach and get out and wave, or you could put your kayak in and paddle up. But it's 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 the first mile or two above the lake in the spring. We're just, I mean, the biggest smallmouth I've seen them shock up. If that Green River below the dam. Is the only other one that compares to it. Those are the, and South Fork, Kentucky has some nice fish in it too because it's just got so much habitat and it has really good water quality. It has some siltation issues, but there's really no coal mining in the drainage and the logging has been gone for a long time. Um, so the, the fish populations there are really, really improving. But the Lysa Fork, all of them are doing better and better. Each year that goes by, the better they get. And the smallmouth populations are starting to ch -ch 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 -ch. musky, everything, and some of the streams that hold musky, they're, they're improving. Rapid. So, what you what you have that, that the acid mine drainage and stuff shut off and it's gone. Mother Nature heals herself incredibly quick. Consider what you know. A lot of these streams are the new river and in, in, that flows into the Big South Fork down in McMurray County. Um, it flows out of Tennessee. It's still 95% biologically dead. From it has so much uh, acidity coming into it from old mines. And yeah. but. In areas where that the mining has ceased and there's no leakage, and, and it's, it's amazing how quickly the, the, the benthic life, the macroinvertebrates, the base of the food chain is what you got to have strong. And if you have a lot of siltation or you have acidic water, they get wiped out, then your fish populations crash. So as long as you have a good uh, um, environment for that to happen, then you're going to have big fat small ones. Because Good, good microinvertebrates, good crayfish, good sculpins, good everything, make for big fat smallmouths. So, which I'm a big fan of. <laughs> but I'm telling you, get above fish trap here in spring where it starts, where it's flowing again. And you will smack. But the pictures I saw just make your dance spin. I mean, two of them like that. Like, either one of them would make my year. Either one of those fish there you're holding would make my year. 
You know, you don't, anything above 18 inches in a screen is a fantastic small. And it's very, very telling of the health of the stream. It is. And when you get to that 19 and 20 inch range, those are once a decade fish or maybe once in a lifetime of fishing fish. And, and I saw those in, in the upper part of fish trap. Fish trap's doing good. That, that lake is, has good health, good fish population. We're very blessed here with Pinesville Lake as well. And Dewey Lake. I love Pinesville. County. My brother-in-law used to live here in Pinesville. Um, and we used to go out to Pinesville Lake. I caught so many spotted bass out there. It was a, a little black worm. And he was in a runabout, really, with a fishing boat, but they'd be swimming. I'd be, <laughs> and I caught a million little 14-inch uh, spots out of there. We tried to get the smallmouth restarted again, but just the way the lake has aged, it just didn't do. We lost the smallmouth. It just didn't do. And also, what and I've written about it, um, what hurt, too, is where the core was drawing the water. They were basically pulling the smallmouth habitat out of the lake. So we tried to get them to change that a little bit. And, um, and, and we've had very mixed results. We stopped a bunch of them in their Dale Hollow strain. Uh, I went down and documented them shocking the fish up that took to the hatchery. They spawned them off and then put them back into Dale Hollow and then took their fry and put them in Thanks for Lake. So the, the, the ones that are in there are Dale Hollow strain. So, but it's just, and then it's helped the cores change the depths from which they release because that cool oxygenated water smallmouths have to have. It's also impacted the walleye as well. You know, the walleye are not as good as they were 15 years ago. But also the lake is aging and getting more fur, which is more benefits to spotted bass and, and the largemouths to the, to the uh, uh, herd of smallmouths and, and walleye to the detriment of searching for water. <laughs> so, uh, any other questions? I, pl I plan to keep writing this until we run out of good places to, to, to write about. Well, you're so. going to be writing a long time. Mm -hmm. I know. <laughs> I'd like to get, places. really, we'd like to get to 45 maybe, yeah. maybe 50 if we can do it, you know. Um, and eventually, what, what, we have it free on the website, but we'd like to put in some kind of waterproof book so people could take it with them and, and fold it out. I've got, the, I've got several books that are designed to, to fold out into a plastic bag and you take it in your boat with you and like, oh, okay. Um, there's one that, that inspired me to this called the Buffalo River Handbook, Buffalo River, Arkansas. It's incredible. I mean, he describes every single bluff. And I mean, he has it, everything. I mean, this guy is, you know, he was in, instrumental in getting the park formed and everything. And he, he knows, I mean, every rock along that river. But it's great. It's designed to be folded out in a plastic bag. You're like, okay, all of a sudden, there's sitting bluff. All right, okay. He describes this. All right, we're here. Then you can relax. You know, once you run it a couple of times, then you're fine. But that first time on the stream is apprehensive time because you just don't know how long it's going to take you to get to. And there's a lot of times where I've been so worried about it, I didn't fish much. I was paranoid. And then I'm like, oh, man, it's 3 o'clock. We're here already. Yeah. Crap. <laughs> I overdid it. So that's no fun either. So you want to get the most benefit out of it as you can. Um, and knowing where you're at really helps because it takes that anxiety at least the first couple of trips. Once you do it, you'll, you'll know about the night. Because you'll have signposts in that. Oh, last time we were here, it was 4 o'clock, and we got in at 6.30. Okay. We got two and a half more hours in straight back. Any other questions? Just by virtue of the Blue Water Trail and your and your staying so busy writing and designating and, and informing, it speaks to the popularity. Mm -hmm. What is your opinion of the economic impact that it has for the communities that are, are well, seeking to do this? Um, I, you know, I wish I knew more, but I, I can't see where it hurts. I know, like the Green River Paddle Trail in Greensburg, um, you may want to study that. Is a, that, that shot through the roof. Um, they Even the cities built cabins that they make money with. They rent them out. There's a boat ramp down the bottom. You float right to the boat ramp drive down, put your boat on, drive up the hill, stay in the cabin. And they're reasonable and they're nice. I've stayed in them. They're like $75 a night. You just split that three ways. That's not much. And, uh, you know, the, the, they have a stove and a microwave and a shower and, you know, and a grill out front and plenty of parking for boats. Fantastic. So a lot of people are doing that. And there's several options you have. You can do a little short one from a, that's two and a half miles from a park. You float back home go just a little bit further up and double that to about four miles or you can go up to what a place called Thunder Road or, or Ro it's Roseville <laughs> Ford but we call it Thunder Road because that's the access and then that's an all day or you need to put in a daybreak and plan to take out at dark 
But there's a bridge right beside the things, and once you go into the bridge, the, the, the ramp is right there. So people use it. I mean, that has exploded in popularity. So for Greensburg, it's been a wonderful thing. Their city is invested in places for paddlers to stay. Um, I know on the Rock Castle River I did a Blue Water Trail. Um, they, uh, the county judge executive called the commissioner saying, we've seen an increase, we'd like to be designated, and, uh, and it's, it's on, that's one of the first ones I wrote. Um, so, and if you go to Frankfort, um, Canoe Kentucky now has two shops. They do uh, river tours on the Kentucky River. They rent kayaks and canoes for you to float the main stem of the creek. Um, and, and on the weekends, it's almost love too much. I go now when it's cold. Because during the summer, I take a day off or take a half day off. Because man, Saturday and Sunday, it's just a zoo. And a lot of them are from Cincinnati, and they get and can be kind of irritating. <laughs> I had one. We had waited a mile one time. We were catching small mouths, and this group of canoes comes and just parks right there in front of us. We're standing there with our fishing rods. It's like you've got ten holes that way and ten holes that way where there's no one. Why are you parking right where we're fishing? Like we weren't there. We were some bad people. City folks. Yeah, they were. <laughs> they get out. And then they're drinking their wine and have a little cheese and wine, all that. And I was like, are we invisible? We, I mean, we said it real loud. I was like, damn, I didn't know I was invisible. You know, we were mad. It's like, couldn't you have went 100 more yards down? There's a perfectly good hole right there for you to beach and drink your wine and eat cheese. But no, not right on top of where, and we were smacking them too. As soon as that happened, the fish went down. We just walked home cussing. Uh, you know, so you have some of that. <laughs> We've had a council come out and visit us, yeah. and uh, he, he well, brought us a well. It's his son-in-law, Nathan, definitely yeah. probably a real good buddy of mine. And uh, if you want to buy a boat, you know, I mean, there's a lot of places around here to get a canoe. But I know a lot of people from uh, South Fork, Kentucky that I talked to, they bought their boats at Canoe Kentucky because he carries top, top of the line, but he also has a lot of used and demo boats that he'll let go half off this time of year. But the wonderful thing is, He'll, he'll bring three or four out right behind the shop. You get in and paddle. If you're going to spend money on a boat, drive it. You wouldn't go to the car lot and just point at a truck. I'll buy that one without getting in it and driving it around. So a lot of people buy a canoe and a kayak doing the same thing. But you can go to Nathan's shop, get in, and he'll, he'll let you spend a half hour on each boat. And you paddle it and see how it feels. I would have bought the wrong boat without demo. So thank God my first big boat that I'd saved and saved. Um, I got to test drive it, and I was like, wow, this one, I don't like this one, I love this one. And it was a great decision, that boat is, that's what my wife mainly paddles in, and that's my rough water boat. It can handle uh, really big standing waves. I mean, I've had waves break, and I'm just, it's really stable in rough water. And I, that's what I like, I don't want to flip my stuff. I, mean, I, I spend a lot of time, I build a lot of my own fishing rods, I hate to leave them on the bottom of the stream, because I flip. But uh, it, that's a great place if you want to, you're willing to make an investment in a good boat and you want to test drive it. And it's worth the drive to Frankfurt to go out there and do it. And then take a float. You get a lifetime shuttle too when you buy a boat. So my wife and I do that all the time. They shuttle us off. You can't beat that. For free, I give them a $10 deal. Mm -hmm. you know, but 10 bucks, I'll pay that. And then you float right back to the shop, get your car going. It's great. Perfect. Any other questions? As you can see, I, I don't mind talking much. We like it. We like it. I mean, we're, we're information junkies, so we're all about that. Does anyone else have any questions for Lee? So I look forward to, in the future, we're going to do Tug Fork this summer. The Vice Fork will be the next up on the Rota. It usually takes me, I write in one year, I do all the groundwork and stuff. Then we do the pictures. Then I write it. Sometimes it may be the next year before that one comes out. If we need an immediate, because we like them to match the seasons. Mm -hmm. You don't want to do a summer one summer and there's no leaves on the trees and it's all in this winter time look you know it doesn't seem to grow so we want them to match so if it's spring we like it to look like spring and summer we like it to look like summer we're going to push the tug fork one a little bit we're going to do the floats in late spring so we can get it published right. but we'll have some greenery and it'll look nice it won't look winter dead so uh, nice. so it'll be that'll be and and also last thing i like to only profile i know we'll mention all the sections but we like to do two or three really good floats that have good fishing and good access. So we may leave off a chunk of this and leave off a chunk of that. But I'll say there's other options available, blah, blah, blah. And I don't like to go much over 10 miles between access points. I've done them where there's 10 or 12, 15 miles, like at, at uh, Licking River, and they say they do those in half a day. But man, 10 miles, 
that is a lot of water if you're doing any fishing or you're taking any time. Uh, pretty much you need to paddle the entire time to cover 10 miles a day. Sometimes you go up to 12 is my cutoff. Now they say up there that's a 15 mile float. I measure it's more like 11. But they start early in the morning and they get in at dark and they don't stop. So I, I like to have four to eight, nine mile stretches where there's good access. So uh, don't be offended if part of it's left off because we want them where there's a, a concentration of good access points and cool riffle type water. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do some flat water, blue water trails, but people like flowing water. Like they do. That. It's a lot of fun. Yes, but much more fun. Kentucky River's fine, but if somebody blows by you in a 200 horse bass boat and throws you a wake that big and you're holding on for dear life. So much prefer cool riffle, the sound of flowing water. That's, that's it. And that's where small enough is. So that's my favorite species. Any other questions? Anybody? So please get on our website, fw.ky.gov, go under boat, and then check out the canoeing kayaking page. We're constantly adding to it and making it better. And you can get all these and print off the mats. Tons of free information that will put butts in kayaks. Mm -hmm. And without fear of, oh, this is a quasi-public spot. Um, you know, anything that can screw you up, I'm going to include in the narrative. Okay? And also the fishing. All right. I've enjoyed talking to you all night. We've enjoyed Thank having you. you. Thank you so much. I want to add, and I was going to ask, um, when your commissioner came over to Friends of the Tug meeting, mm -hmm. just for you ladies, if you all haven't gotten your fishing licenses yet and your hunting license, get out there and do that. The fastest growing demographic mm -hmm. among fisher, fisher people and are hunter, women. hunters are women. And and reason being is uh, it's a lot of fun. My wife's like, it's she was times. scared to death. I mean, she just, she, we did canoeing a little bit, but after last summer, I took her, I was like, all right, I'm getting my new boat. This is your boat now. I bought her a nice paddle, too. Don't skimp on the paddle. No. That's one last thing. Don't get a cheap paddle. Get a good one. Get a, a Carlisle's a good brand, but I, I love Werner, and I love bending branches, but they're expensive. But, you know, you wouldn't put a, a five horse on a big bass boat. So if you buy a cheap paddle that, that uh, that's just plastic and heavy, you're, you're putting a five horse uh, motor on a on a brand new bass boat because your your paddle is your engine. If we you bought want to a spend more money, don't skimp on the paddle. Get a good paddle. Good one. Yeah, the, the Warner paddle is wonderful. It is. Expensive. It's a very good paddle, and don't worry, it doesn't wear you out. No, because it's light. It's made out of carbon fiber. And I got one for Stacy. She loves it. But she was scared the first time she went around a rap. She was like, ooh, and she was all nervous. <laughs> then I said, follow me, and we went to the left, and we went through a really good drop where she got water in her face and it got fast, and got she came out and she went. Wee! And after that, she was hook, line, and sinker. I didn't hear another word. I'm scared. I'm this. I'm that. She, after a while, she started pulling out in front of me. I'm going first. I was like, "You go in, but just make sure you go left, because <laughs> I, I know which of the good, good lines that, that won't get you upset." And once you do it, you're hooked. Yeah, and even after flipping in cold water in October and getting cold, I thought, "Well, her paddling career is over." She just, I just told her not to freak out about spiders. She's already talking about, when are we going battling? When are we going to take yeah. the kayaks out? Oh, so yeah. A couple of weeks, we'll be, we'll be at it again. So. And uh, there's some great groups that you can get involved in. Want to tell us real quick about your group? Yeah, we're just a little Facebook page. We put our pictures on. We ride mostly Russell Ford, Bill Advisor, Russell Ford from Elkhorn downstream. Mm -hmm. Now, in October, when they have that uh, release up there, that's not us. No. <laughs> no doubt. We had figured out that we can put in down there at Elkhorn Creek or at the East End Bridge mm -hmm. and wait on that water to come and pick us up. And there's some pretty, pretty breathtaking stuff on okay. down below there. And you get out there at the BB&T Bank at Belcher. That's, mm -hmm. a, mm -hmm. that's, that's not a novice thing either. I mean, that's, that's good beautiful. Fun, that is beautiful right. country I mean, through there. Yes. If you if you go up there, maybe go up there and watch them in the brakes, run through the brakes in that white water. You want to try something? That water hits in town about 1.32 o'clock. Has anybody been to the brakes and, and watched that up there? Watch the white water run. If you want something exhilarating, mm -hmm. that's just a short drive from home. Go watch that. It brings people from um, I All think the world. World last world year world. they had world 16 world. or 18 countries represented there. 
What is it in October? October. Um, do you all every, have every weekend? Every weekend in October. Every weekend, right? So I, no, I think it's the first three weekends. Is my okay. First three weekends, Friday. They have a release Saturday or Sunday. But there's tons of places that you can uh, that you can get there along the the rocks and along and uh, watch it go down. I wouldn't recommend getting in that water unless you're like those people and you're an expert at it because it is whoa. It's they, very very swift. You can't ride that in summer. They tube that in summer. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's also it's really fun in the spring summer. Oh yeah. Water's a lot I have tubed on it. Now tubing is fun. Yeah, it's, it's waist deep probably for the most part mm -hmm. in the summer. So it's and still it's a lot just, of fun. Though. It's just a beautiful place and a lot of fun to go watch. Oh, yeah, it's breathtaking. Mm -hmm. And uh, small mouths and that are getting better and better too. Well, every, yeah, everybody here at Russell Fork, and they're kind of afraid of it. But mm -hmm. you put it in there around Elkhorn, it's <coughs> yeah, it's manageable from there now. Yeah, I, as a matter of fact, you have to watch. You know, and sometimes there's sometimes there's not enough water. Not enough, yeah. We, we ran into that last summer in a couple of our places where we run. There was and really not enough. You know, there was too much having to really, jimmy really around. Really, so much. From Elkhorn, different stretches. You get to Allen and you think you're on a lake. It's so big. It is. It's huge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I encourage you all to think about doing, uh, getting out and doing the paddle sports because you do not have to be an athlete. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be... Uh, you know, 140 pounds and, and train 10 times a week to, to enjoy paddle sports. Almost anybody can enjoy paddle sports, including uh, we have a couple of folks that are affiliated with our Trail Town team there that have some physical handicaps that we're trying to work out ways that they can get in and enjoy as well. And um, our lake staff out there is, they're getting ready to put in a kayak launch facility, uh, an aid so that uh, even folks with the handicaps or disabilities can get in and out of the canoe with a little bit of ease. Mm -hmm. And if you come to our events that Trail Town is sponsoring, we always have uh, groups of youth that are in our volunteer committee. And this is Catherine Castle, and she's our volunteer committee head. And we have a, uh, a plethora of young people that come out, and that's what they come out for. They come out to assist people in and out of kayaks to help them you know, get stable and uh, we always have groups of people, so I encourage you to come and do that because I think now for the, I want to say 15, 15th year running, non-motorized watercraft far outnumber motorized oh, watercraft yeah. because folks can't afford it. Mm -hmm. uh, kayaking is the everyday guy's sport. Mm -hmm. kayaking I mean, that's, you know, I've always been into it, but it, you know, I wanted a boat for years. But one can afford it. <laughs> well, I mean, and, and I don't, you know, the way my property is, I can't store it in my house. I'd have to have storage. That's at least a thousand dollars a year there for just, you know. And, and you think about how many times you actually use it, unless you're super hardcore in your tournament angle. Clean it, yeah, you know. Clean, clean it before you take it out, take it out, and bring it home, clean it again. Right. Yeah, no, all, I mean, we've got thirteen kayaking. boats in our boathouse. Do I? We've got thirteen boats in our boathouse. <laughs> Ain't one of them got a motor in it. There you go, man. That's what I'm talking about. Um, thank you, Lee. I appreciate you so much. I appreciate your your departments uh, being so uh, progressive thinking because uh, realizing that when you encourage the, the sport, you encourage the sportsmanship. Mm -hmm. You get people out there. The first fish I ever caught from a kayak, uh, man, I was, I've been a fisherman all my life, but to catch one from a kayak, and pull it in there and oh it was exciting yeah, it's <laughs> it extremely was, exciting it was very exciting <laughs> i was thinking what am i gonna do with this now i got in here <laughs> but um but i encourage you all to get out and enjoy that those little fish grabbers i've got some from bass pro that look like a pistol that float best thing in the world for a kayak because yeah they'll be flopping around you just pull it up you never even touch it yep. you got it and uh, rapala makes some too they're like pliers mm -hmm. but i like the ones that pinch like this better you just pull it and and you lift it up, you pop that hook, lift it over, pull the trigger, and you never then, touch it. Yeah, my husband got a Rapala. Yeah. It's very easy to use. It's, it's, yeah, and, it was, and it was affordable. Mm -hmm. It was really a They float, get one to float up. Yeah, or you'll lose it. Sure is working. Um, so, thank you, Lee. I appreciate you so much. So, that's what we're working on on this trail system, uh, Trail Town. And um, I wanted to mention, because it's very, very important, something he touched on about private property. Um, the Kentucky Mountain Regional Recreation Authority, the reason that was developed is so that we could work on trails of all kinds 
that cross county lines, that cross private property, that, co that cross public domain, and that authority, and we're now 22 counties strong with 22 local governments supporting that authority, and the state supporting it through the Department of Local Government. That authority is going to offer private landowners uh, a little bit of relief from the stress of worrying about uh, insurance and liabilities and things like that because the authority is going to carry some of that burden. And once you get people, um, private landowners, once you give them that peace of mind that we're going to help you manage this and you can open your property up and allow people to enjoy it as a trail, then you get a lot more people that are willing to do it. Previously, when there was a lot of liability and stigma attached with that, folks weren't so weren't so game to do that. You know, they, they were like, I don't know about all that. I don't know about four wheelers. I don't know about people up on my property because of the liability. So hopefully, with the authority and with that taking hold, um, every county in our region is in the authority. So. <clears throat> and I'm very blessed that our judge executive has allowed myself and Trail Town as a team to participate in that authority so that we can stay on the edge of what's happening with it. And I think that's going to increase the, uh, decrease the problems with private property. I think that's going to significantly decrease the problems with that and open more places up to everybody. Uh, one of the issues, another of the issues that we deal with here in Eastern Kentucky, and if you do, if you're like my husband and I, and you do any traveling at all, you'll know that this is the truth. Uh, we we have an issue with garbage. Garbage is like a huge thing here. Not so much anywhere else. You can travel just a couple of hours away from here, and trash is not an issue. It's a uh, some of it is an economic thing. It's because of uh, folks not having the ability economically to afford uh, to dispose of their garbage <coughs> in a proper way. Some of it is just the vastness of these haulers and, and the terrain and how garbage piles up and, and enters into the water, waterways and the trails and things like that. But it's an issue. And uh, there are a lot of folks that work very diligently trying to put together groups to collect garbage and trail town is no exception we have a cleanup coming up tidy the trail tidy the trail i'm telling you that tidy the trail <laughs> april the 14th come out and help us pick up garbage we picked up 2300 pounds last year and uh, that is not from people using the trail and dropping garbage that is garbage that makes its way from the roadways from being thrown out the windows and we all need to be uh, thinking, <coughs> thinking the big picture on that. How can we fix this? What can we do? What can we, how can we change this mindset where people toss this garbage? It gets garbage? bad on Elkhorn Creek in the summer. It, it's horrible, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 So. Uh, at Elkhorn and Franklin. Yeah. Uh, uh, all the, yeah. You know, I pick up, I bring a bag with me about every time mm. I pick up and see, I can fill it up in the first <coughs> yard. So it's a, it's a huge issue. And leading right into that, there are a lot of people that are trying to figure out ways to address that issue. And one of those people is our next speaker, and this is Miss Chris Morning. And Chris is uh, President and CEO of a company called Nanostar. And she's going to tell you about one of the ideas they have for addressing garbage. It's all your sister. And while my pet guy gets everything set up, I'm just going to give you a little bit of the history of how my company got started. In 2014, I had what is known as catastrophic life events. Okay? And that's when you have things happen outside of the road that are catastrophic. And so what happened with me was uh, my job ended in uh, February. In March, I was in the hospital with renal failure with both kidneys blocked off by kidney stones. And I was hours from death. And the doctor told me, he said, if you hadn't come, Chris, he said, and when you did, he said, I, we won't be having this conversation. You'd be sick, and we'd be flying you out, be touch and go where you live to die. So I went through two additional surgeries after the first surgery to save my life and unlock the kidneys, and went almost a year with uh, out working. And at the end of 2014, I said, Lord, I am not going through another year like this again, so you tell me what I need to do. And he did. And he started talking to me about a business. A few months later, my pastor came to me. He said, Chris, we got to do something to keep jobs in Eastern 
Kentucky. He said, our people are leaving in droves. We've got to do something. So what are we going to do? So we sat down with Brian, who is our IT guy. We started putting all this together. And that formed our company, Nanostar Incorporated. Now, Nanostar is an unusual name, but not really, because the Lord kept talking to me about despise not the day of small beginnings. Nano smile, start beginning. Nano start. Okay. Sorry. My computer shut down. around the day because I had had such trouble with the uh, keynote and well actually not keynote my computer every time I tried to translate to PowerPoint then it would lose some of the animations and stuff from keynote so I was laughing day I said this is not good for a tech driven research and development company. <laughs> that will trouble technology. <coughs> Introduce myself. I'm Chris Varney. I'm the CEO and co-owner of Now Start Incorporated. That's Brian Boyd. He's our information technology specialist. And sitting here in the front row is Darvin Belcher. He's our vice president. He's going to take over in a little bit. I'm going to run through a little bit, and he's going to take over. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the future, and it is now. Research and Development Company. We have over 30 products in various stages of development, from concept to prototyping to finish. What we do is we provide solutions. What we have done and, and are continuing doing is looking for problems, we identify a problem, and then we take it to our think tank and to our engineers and to various people, and we come up with a solution. what we do. We provide innovative products for solving some of the critical problems facing our world. City, region, state, nation, and to the nations. We are a growing country. <coughs> and this is how we do it. We take a two-step method that assesses the problem, then uses new and existing technology to provide a solution. We put them together in non-traditional ways, which you'll see in just a moment. From that, we have a product that solves the problem. Okay, one of our first products. Here is the problem. We have the spread of infectious diseases, HIV, hepatitis B and C, drug use, the use of that, shared needles, um, healthcare workers that get accidentally stuck, things like that. We thought about it, and we said, how can we solve this problem? NIPS, the Needle Internal Processing System, proprietary system. It's small, it's portable, it takes care of the problem, use a proprietary system that shears the needle off at the point it goes into the syringe. It reseals the syringe so it cannot be used with another needle. It takes the needle, recycles it, and if you'll notice as I go through this, 
Our products are very eco-friendly. They use recycling to help with and solve your problem. Go ahead. Click on that. We've actually done some preliminary um, test marketing on this product and it uh, has been very favorably received. Uh, doctors' offices, hospitals, you take it, you take it with you. Everybody knows the people that go around and take your blood when you're in the hospital. You take it with you, they can take it with them. When they're finished, right in it, it's done. It can't be reused, it can't stick, they can't get into it. It's a very safe system. And we have actually um, thought of and are going to, when all this is ready, we're going to donate some of these to the Doctors Without Borders. So they'll be able to use it for them, sure. Because what we want to do is not only create jobs, retain skilled workers, make self-sustaining communities, but we want to bless people. Bless regions, cities, nations. All right. Everyone knows there's always a need for clean drinking water. 700 million people worldwide drink contaminated water. What would you do if I told you we have a product that provides clean drinking water without the need for harsh chemical additives, no sandstone, no limestone, no charcoal. But it cleans the water of all organic and inorganic materials. And preliminary testing show that it will clean up even anthrax. Now think about that, it's something you ever got into our water system from a terrorist attack. And we call it Nano Pure. Guys don't work good here. No, I'm kind of slow on it. You put too many stops in there. Okay. This is what NanoPure does. NanoPure in there, it purifies the contaminated water, just like I said, of all inorganic or organic materials. Okay, now think about that. And I'm going to show you, you won't believe, because we're, we use city water to do some initial testing. And I'm going to show you in a minute what's in your city water. Okay. This is our concept testing, proving the process works. This is what's in your city water. See how it's separated water, HGO, from the organics, inorganics in the water. Okay? That is pure, pure, pure water. And there's the things that they add to it to purify it. The advantage is to the nano pure, does not require any chemicals. It's scalable, we can use it at home or we can use it in a large municipal plant. You'll notice a lot of things we go, a lot of our products are scalable. They can either be for home use or we can use them at large city um, scale. So they work almost anywhere. It's a lower energy requirement to operate. You also notice a lot of our stuff involves uh, saving of energy. Removes organic and inorganic materials. Cost effective and very eco friendly. Everybody likes those words. Okay. okay. Alright, 1.3 billion tons of garbage, billions, is produced throughout the world every year. In the US alone, we produce 230 million tons of trash every year, or an average of five pounds per person every day. Yes, we have a garbage problem. Okay. Now, I want you to imagine a couple of things. Imagine that you are standing in a suburban street that used to be a landfill. Or that you're at a disaster site where the infrastructure has been destroyed, yet you have electricity, hot water, you can take a shower, wash clothes, and you also can um, have electricity, wash your clothes, and take a hot shower but the infrastructure is gone. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, introducing and this is where Darvis will take over in just a second and talk to you about this product that we are all excited about. 
the Phoenix 21, a refuse-derived fuel system. Darvin? I don't do all that stuff. I'm a fortune. Don't worry about me. <laughs> don't worry about me nodding my head at you, Brian. <laughs> all right, so here's the thing. Go ahead and show the unit, Brian. We've got, I've got a little small town I live in in Jenkins. And then you mentioned the water thing. Uh, we get these little scales, papers that's got these little scales. You know what they say? Um, shoot, don't drink the water. Uh, the people come do the test and they say, don't drink the water. Uh, there's fish in the little thing and the kids go down fish and they say, you can eat one because don't drink the water. So, is there a problem with the water? Yeah. Uh, and what's the problem? Uh, our problem. Trash. Garbage. That's the main thing. And we can try our best to clean things up unless there's something done. Uh, I'll give you for instance. I lived in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And my area, I was an insurance salesman. In my area that I went to, they separated. You're a white guy. You're going to go to the white area. And we had 38 people. Half were white, half were black. The black people went to the black, the white people went to the white. Well, I was new in town, so when someone called, I would just go wherever. It didn't make no difference. I was in the hood and didn't know it. Had no idea. I moved there and started selling insurance. Right dead center in the hood. And one of the guys come up to me and he said, do you know where you've been? And I said, no, I have no idea. He said, when you go home, I want you to do me a favor. What's the 6 o'clock or the 11 o'clock news? So I get on and he said, look at the street. So I get on there and I'm looking in the street and there's two, three, four people killed every night on that street that this guy was walking through that, you know, <laughs> Oreo was walking through. And, and I had no idea. So, they moved me to, and said, you do not go to that area, right? So, they moved me to an area that was prominent white, except for one little old bitty place. And most of those people that were in that place were black. But they were great people, but they were black. And I was wondering, I said, how come these people all around here, you know the little Debbie's, the cakes that we get? That's where they make the little Debbie cakes at, where I was at. So, whenever you got... Drive down 75 before you get to Chattanooga. If you roll your window down, you can smell the factory when you're going through. And I'm out and I get out of the factory, and this very, very bad stench comes up. And I'm wondering, what's that smell? And I go to this lady, and she's like, Well, what smell? So I go to my next one. They're black. I go to the next one, and I and I said, That smell, what's that smell? And she's like, What smell? They had lived there so long, they didn't know the smell. They had, take the, they had taken these black people and put them on top of a landfill and covered it up with dirt and let them come and put houses on it. And that's where these people were living at. Now, I tell you that, we had a problem that arose up in Detroit, Michigan. They got a power, an incinerator there that puts off carbon, that puts off methane, all this thing does within, I think it's what, two mile radius? The air, do you ever know that the wind blows in one direction? And when it blows in a different direction, there's a storm coming. But for the majority, our wind comes what? West to east, right? Storms come west to east. Up there, the air comes right by that incinerator. It's killing everybody up there. The air blowing by. The children have got asthma. Now the children, as they get 16, they've got lung problems. So we called them and told them we had the answer to the problem. We could fix them. And they said, not until people have got 15,000 votes on a sheet of paper that they have come, and they go and register, they can put it on. Until then, until we have people dying, we're not going to do anything. So he said, when people start dying, and they vote, we'll call you. And I said, what about until then? He said, we ain't calling you. So, these big incinerators have got one thing and one thing only. They're owned in Russia and Germany. And they could care less about us. This plant can go anywhere. Doesn't make no difference. Uh, last year, Florida, the hurricane come through. 
Texas. What do you do in Texas? You know, well, Texas was absolutely what? Destroyed. And the worst storm that has ever been, the costliest storm that has ever been. So what are you going to do with your stuff? Everything has to be what? Where are you going to put it at? Now, even here, all this goes in here. This is the process that comes through that burns. The separates, the material comes out, even tires. Everything comes out of it. These are generators. You can take this and put it on a beach somewhere where there's a problem. doesn't make any difference. Now, we've got a little old bitty small town. Anybody know where Jenkins is at? One of the smallest cities in the state of Kentucky. And they are by one. Already on the board and getting their paperwork done to buy one. Now, here's the big thing with these, uh, with this Phoenix. You put the garbage in, and you're eliminating the garbage problem, right? You're eliminating the money that the city is going to have to pay, that the county is going to have to pay. You're eliminating that, right? Now, if that would be good enough if that was just good enough, right? But it's not. Now, but we have power system that comes off that grid and that burning. Every ton of garbage that goes in generates $25 worth of electricity that you can turn around and sell right back to AEP. So it's a win, win, win. Now, what's the only problem that we always have with the water? Uh, always was up in uh, Virginia, as I worked up in Virginia, as you come down, you can see the milk jugs up in the trees, the diapers in the trees, the gallon jugs. And do you know, have any idea, because I, I never actually pursued this because I worked 25 years underground in a coal mine, and I know, and I treated water. Uh, I had six different ponds to treat water every day, all day, all day long, to try to treat the water, just to make it feasible for people. And actually had some guys that people have been told this and, and they said they was chemicals in the water and they went down and they took their glasses and put their glasses in the water and picked it back up and put it on and said it broke their nose out and had lawsuits, which, which there wasn't. So there's always been a problem with what? Garbage and water. You guys have the water system and our system has cleaned up, has it not? Since the coal has lessened up, our system has cleaned up. I've, I've been on the boat. I've done the whole thing, what you're talking about, the whole canoeing thing, the whole thing. Now, we have to do something to clean up our whole area. Everything that we got, every job that will be, will be right here. Every job. Nothing is come going anywhere. Everything's going to be right here. It is here. It's in Prestonsburg. The jobs are going to be in Eastern Kentucky. The jobs are not going to go any, anywhere else but right here. And that's the way we want uh, you, you may not know, but maybe your sister, brother, and uncle, something may be working for us. And our big thing is, with this whole thing is, is helping people out. It's a Christian-based organization. And we have money, we give money, and we're going to give money. We have people in this area that are absolutely starving to death. And people are dying every day. Our families are have people dying every day. One of the biggest reasons why is what? Drugs. How come? How come? No hope. No job? No hope. And I have been a pastor for 15 years in a drug rehab center and have seen over 10,000 men come in and go. And you know what the number one thing is? I felt unworthy. And my wife left me. I never see my children. Everything was gone. You know, the job went. So we have to do come together. We come together. We everyone have to come together. And if you sit and look at it, I can tell you about this Phoenix and I can give you reports. I can tell you that a water bottle takes 1,000 years to disintegrate in a landfill. The plastic bags we get at Walmart, 1,000 years. We ain't going to be here for 1,000 years, but that's how long it takes. But this plant will take anything and everything. Um, now we have uh, sewer. We have our sewer lines. We have our sewer system. 
that stuff is left out of the sewer system, you can put it right back in here. Everything goes here. Everything is here. Everything. So we need to strive, like I said, we all need to strive together, right? All need to come together, uh, and we all need to uh, know fully well we need jobs, we need people, and we need families. You're not going to see anybody on a canoe, on the water, if everybody leaves and everybody's gone. Letcher County, Letcher County had 1,700 people in their school, the kids in their school. You know how many they got now? 800. Shelby Valley had, 11, uh, had 1,100 kids. You know how many they got now? 460. Wonder why? Everybody's gone. We have to get our people back here. And our whole economy will grow in leaps and bounds. Amen? The battery place is coming up. The silver authority is coming up. That's coming up in Pipeville. Uh, Pipeville shouldn't be the only place that's getting this. Floyd County should be getting these places. Johnson County should be getting these places. We all need these places, but we all have to come together to get these places. All of us. Amen? We all have to. All right, let's go. Short and sweet. Somebody else. Quick question. Quick question. You mentioned sewage. Did you run sewage through that? Yes. When you run your sewage through, let me, I, I'm not going to get groceries. That's a big issue we have right here. Right? When you got your sewer is <laughs> run through your plant, we got one down here in Francis work, right? Right outside the college. The sewer plant comes through a purifier. When that goes through its system, they call them patties. Poop cake. Well, I didn't go poop, but that's what they call them. That has to be done away with. That goes in here. That stuff can be put here. To, and that's that's that whole purification. Jenkins, let me let me explain this to you. Jenkins has a six thousand dollars a month uh, garbage bill that they have to pay fifty dollars a ton, and they're online to buy this. Okay, I go over to Norton, Virginia. You know how much theirs is a year? Three million dollars. Jenkins is seventy two thousand. Norton, three million. And I go over to offer this plant to them. So that's, you know, the, what it can do and how it can do. But the good thing about it is what got me on board with Chris and everything, the whole thing is, is jobs, jobs, jobs. Because i seen my best friends leave to go to Pennsylvania, to Alabama to work. I've seen my family pull up and I go up and where are you going? U-Haul. U-Hauls, U-Hauls. And I just got sick and tired of it. Something's got to give. And it's up to us to do something. And if you've got, if we've got 800 people coming to the battery place in two years, the Blue Tech, how many more people is that going to be? You times that by two or three. That's how many more people is going to be in Pike, in Pike County. They're all not going to be in Pike County. They're all not going to live there. They're going to be in different places. So they're going to be doing more recreational things. They're going to be in the water. The Brakes Interstate Park is one of the biggest, well, unknown that there is in Eastern Kentucky. One of the most beautiful places there is, one of the most beautiful places to go and to do everything that you guys are talking about. So once again, once we get jobs, once we get people, once a, and this has to be laid out already, but you, you get people, well, you get people, what, what's the draw to Eastern Kentucky? You know, everybody thinks we're what? Dumb hillbillies. That's what everybody thinks, you know? They're just dumb hillbillies. Until they get here and they see and they look and they understand. Uh, they're very, for, uh, what is it called? Peculiar people we are. Yeah, we were back 30, 40 years ago, you know. You step on my land, I'll shoot you. You move my pole, I'll shoot you. You move my fence, I'll shoot you. That's not such the case anymore. <laughs> Thank the Lord. You know, and, and, and I, I will go somewhere and they'll say, well, where are you from? And I'm like, Eastern Kentucky. Well, yeah, let's take a step back, you know, stuff. I'm like, no. <laughs> you know, until, really. until they start to hear a little bit of what this does, and then they're like, uh, what, planet, what planet are you from? Yeah. Where yeah, have they, you all been? Where have you all been at? Too? I want to tell you guys something, and I don't, I don't mean this in a bad way, because like I said, let, let me, this is very important. But this drug problem is more important than anything that we're faced with because your brothers, your sister, your uncle, your own family, your mom and dad that you don't even know about. All right, so when, and I was telling Chris and Brian this, a lot of people don't know this. Let's take the meth. Let's take the, the bath salt, all this stuff and everything that they've come up with, right? All this stuff. Now, they took 
this stuff and they took it up and they took it to Harvard, they took it to Yale, and they took it to Brown. And they set this stuff down in like these little containers, these three containers right here, and they set it down. And they pulled two professors from each uh, college. And they brought them in and they set them down and they told them, I said, here, we want you to take this and you take this and this and this and you take it back and we want you to do your research on this. And you tell us how long it would take you to come up with this. So they went. There's Harvard, Yale, and Brown. Three of the most prominent. They come back three weeks later and they said it would probably take us a year, a year and a half to come up with this. The whole thing to make this. And they said, there's some people in West Virginia, and people in Kentucky, and people in Tennessee come up with this in three days. And they said, there's no way. And they said, they're the brilliant minds going to waste. Yeah. Yeah. And they are. That's what's here. You know, uh, so... Like I said, your, the canoeing thing, everything, everything that we have, everything that we got going on, the streams, the river, everything, all this coal insides together. Mm -hmm. if we have to clean everything up. What does one of those units cost? It all depends. In this area, it's around a six to seven uh, hundred, what, six or seven? Six to seven hundred. <clears throat> It Six depends or on what you need thousand. to do it for. It, it, the base unit does several things, but there's things you can add to it that does other things. It, it's so versatile. It can do so many things. But the, but the big thing is that Jenkins, <coughs> the guy in Jenkins, is a businessman. And he could see taking the $6,000 a month, putting it in his plant, and then turn around and sell the power back mm -hmm. for $25 a ton. Every ton that goes in is to make twenty-five dollars to each one. There is a big industrial park up there, seventy-five acres, big industrial park. They're going to set this right dead center, right in the end of it. I mean, right on the point of it. Put it on the point, and then all the factories that are coming in up there, they're going to feed the power to them yeah, off the grid, off of this. So they're going to take. Here's the thing: our garbage is going. Our garbage. You know where our garbage goes to? Our garbage, our garbage is in a, in a lock, goes from Jenkins and then the county line. It goes all the way to London. I'm really concerned. I'm really intrigued by this. And this is brilliant. How long would it take something like that to clean out the sewage problem we have here in this table? We can't, we can't get industry in here because we can't tap on. Well, you're we're, not. We're, we're at full capacity. Well, what this will do is this takes the solid waste material uh -huh. that right now you have to pack up and send to the landfill. You're this, talking about you're talking about solid waste. Period. I'm just talking about it, our town is in dire straits right now because we can't get any industry in here. We have been cut off from the states yeah. from any towns. We yep. can't get any jobs. We can't get anything until we upgrade our sewage system. Yep. So I'm, a, okay. so I'm glad you mentioned yeah. that. Now I'll tell you something that happened. Already know, uh, me and Ray Jones, we've already talked about this whole thing. All right. Now let me give you let me give you a little bit of Francis because I'm going I'm getting away from this, but I'm getting into Paintsville and Johnson City and Floyd County because you can't get nobody here unless you've got water. Sewer and electricity. Yeah. Those three things have got to be. If you don't have that with the infrastructure, you can have all the land in the world, but that, that okay. nothing's going to be. Right. So up in uh, what they're calling, uh, up where the Olos used to be, where uh, Silver Liner's gone, where Blue like Tech, Blue Tech like is gone. Yeah. Where Haas just went. Yes. That is, that, that whole place, it costed them, the city of Pikeville, it costed them millions of dollars to go in and put sewer in, water in, and electricity in up there. They, the city paid for it. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the big thing. Guess where, it, guess where the plant, that whole facility is going to be? You know where it's at? In the county. So you know what the city gets out of it? Nothing. They don't get one penny out of it. Not one thing. But, you see, everything that you see, if, it's, if your vision is right here, if you're the smartest person in your group, you need a new group. They're going to reap the benefits. So, what's in Pipe? Do you go to Pipe? You've been there lately? Yep, this morning. Uh, we, the, there's restaurants, 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 and more restaurants being built, and more restaurants that's going to be built. So, the city of Pipe is going to what? Reap all the reward for it all. 
So if Johnson County gets businesses in this area, where they, they, if there's, you go up the road, I, you go on the four lane, if we're on the four lane from Floyd County to Paintsville, how many restaurants are they on that four lane? None. None. Where are they going to have to come to? Here or, or Floyd County? Right? Pa uh, Prestonburg or Paintsville, one of the two. All right, so the new road's going through. They're building a new road from, uh, uh, let's see, Miller, no, not Miller, through Miller, up to, uh, it's 119, is going this way, 80 is going this other way. Two new four lanes going through. So when they get their money this time, let me tell you what happened, and maybe there's something that can help you. This time when the roads go through, they have come up and they had to put a, a bridge through. Leslie Combs was part of the bridge right there that would have, Right, Leslie and Ray was part. They put a bridge across Leviza. Where'd she go? What do you want me to call it? <laughs> across the river. Big Sandy. Yeah. They put a bridge across. They had to get grant money to do it, right? Okay. So when they get, they get the money, they have to get the money for the bridge, and then they have to go up and do the access with the water, the sewer, and electricity. Now, 119 and 80 is going through. They already, when they're doing their work, road work, they went up, you know what they done? They said, we need a bridge over here, part of the funding to come through. We need a bridge that goes across just to take the waste. You, you drive a truck, the rock truck, and the spillage that comes off of it. So now, guess who's paid for it? The government has paid for that bridge to go across. So now, as they're going through, you know what's up there? Water, sewer, and electricity. And guess who paid for it? Our government. For the first time I've ever seen the government actually done something and they didn't know what they was doing. But it was for the benefit. For the benefit of the people. That's right. So we need to do, get on board this whole thing with you guys. And sit down with you guys and do everything that we can with our process to do what we can to do. Because now, when I price this plant to someone out of state, it's $1 million. Or more. But here, it's not. Because we need jobs. We need people, and we need to help. Have you uh, got any in place already? We got, well, the one is actually getting ready to be built. The, for Jenkins. Jenkins. Yeah, for Jenkins. We've and like I said, here's the big thing. Where have you built out? John, uh, Johnson Industry. Oh, yeah. 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 oh. Everything's here. That, that, oh, oh yeah. It's about yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, they are too, but that's my Ray family. Johnson. That's my Ray family. Johnson? Yeah. Yeah, that, that, yeah, but that's that whole thing like we had talked about. Everything stays, everything stays here. They're wonderful people. Yeah, everything stays here. Yeah, they're they're great people. Yeah, they are. We also have an initial agreement with a city in South Carolina to build a huge plant for them. Is it possible to get one here? Well, these the, the big plants. The big plants are talking millions of dollars. We're not talking. We're not talking about a product. We're talking about the plant that will. Oh, that's what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. Oh, the problem. No, we don't want any garbage process. <laughs> well, actually, no. this is what you, the thing is, you got to understand, this destroys, this This doesn't process, do what this, this is not an incinerator. No. Oh, I know that. Yeah. What well, comes I out the other end is sand. sand. But we've sand. got the big plant. We've, we've got a big plant yeah. and a small plant. Yeah. How, this is how a, much would that process of sewage and, a, and, and like a, we would need to do some figuring with so, what your some materials analysis are. as well. Because uh -huh. yeah. we want to make sure we give you exact numbers. We don't want to. But you okay. Can uh, here's a, here's for instance, the one the, the garbage that goes in, a ton of garbage that goes in. I told you twenty five dollars, right? Uh, it's actually more than that. But to say to keep everything straight and to say that we would not lie about anything, you're actually going to generate the more bags. The more that raises. Now we've also got the the stepping for coal to help coal to purify the coal plants. But we're under we're under regulation. EPA with this plant. Here, here's the here's the why. Let me get this for you. The EPA with this plant. You see this little thing right here? That's called a plan on what? Bingo. You know what that does? That eliminates. The EPA, yeah. because yeah. 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 because and when this plant is set, wherever this plant goes, that trailer or a trailer on wheels will be there. 
So this and is technically always considered no EPA problem. You go and get a fifty dollar permit or grant, whatever it is, and that's taken care of. So like I said, but this doesn't this this process. There is no toxins released from it. None whatsoever. Zero. It's extremely eco friendly. And then, plus, it re, plus it produces recyclables yeah. from all those materials you put in, which creates another revenue stream for whoever buys it. And the silicon that comes out of it, which is what after you've done, and there's not a lot of it left, don't get me wrong, but what is left can actually be used on roads for as a, to help tractioning on roads. There's a white lock material yeah. that Mountain Enterprise will, has already pegged and begged for the material because the material goes into the blacktop. It strengthens the blacktop one-fourth more strength and it, you know how you're driving down the road and, and uh, you, all of a sudden you hit your brakes and you slide a little bit? Uh, that's what the strength, it does the grip, the whole thing and stuff. It's like fibrous. Yes ma'am. Yes ma'am. It changes the whole Change the whole texture in blacktop, the whole you see, thing. You see our Yeah, I see it, absolutely. Yeah. But now these generators, let me say, these are generators. These can go like in Puerto Rico, which is still right now starving for water. Uh, that, that plant right there can go and, and generate. You see, all these little islands that we have, you know the islands that you, the, the Bora Bora and Puerto Rico and all these places that you go, you know, they have no power. Everything is run off of generators and every bit of it's generated off of diesel. diesel fuel and how many times do you hear we had a diesel fuel spillage well this takes the problem if you remember the Olympics and you remember it was in well it's the big old place that's got Jesus up on top of it real so do you know when they had the swimming and the canoeing Remember when they had the canoeing? You know what they had to do? They had to postpone the canoeing four hours. You want to know why? Because of the garbage. Yeah, that's a shame. Because of all the garbage. And they had been guided a grant of $20 billion to purify and clean up their whole island, a grant, and they didn't do it. How large is that? That's a trailer. You see the 18, 18 wheeler flat trailer? That's it. It's 40, 46, 47, 48 feet. And depending upon what you need, it can be engineered as big or as small as you need it. Let, let me let me give God the glory here, because you can, and you're right, it is brilliant. This this is the result of my pastor being in a church service, and God downloading to him that the formulas that make everything that makes it work. God gave it straight to him in a church service. But that wasn't all. So he goes to Israel. Yes. <laughs> and he's in Israel and he finds out that Israel has a problem during a little conversation. Uh, if you know anything about the Bible, read the Bible or anything, if you're in Israel in these countries, you know how you're rich? By the animals that you have. Never have any animals that you've got. The same thing is in Israel now. What happens in the summertime if you've got a thousand head of uh, goat and sheep? Uh, and you're in Israel and there's all these, what do they do? Use the bathroom. What happens during it gets about 100 degrees and the smell, all that stuff. So they had a problem. And they didn't know what to do because all their tours had quit coming. And as people couldn't stand the smell. They come at a certain time of the year when the smell went down. Oh, so, that the flies and insects. Oh, yeah. So he hears, the pastor, he hears this conversation that's going on. And he gives them, he said, I've got the uh, answer to your problem. And he gives them the disc with all the schematics on it. They get them, they take it, they work the whole problem, they said, we'll have it back to you in two years. And he told me it exactly. Two years, UPS pulled up and they brought it in and they gave it back to them. So, if you ever want to get blessed with anything, bless, bless Israel. Israel. Bless Israel. Bless Israel, bless Israel first and they'll come back. And here is the stair step yeah. of this whole thing. Yeah. The whole thing. Yeah. How much, how powerful would it be because they built and I'm done. They, they build a big incinerator down in Florida. And all the people said, it's a great thing because we have to do something. Well, what about all the gases that's coming off of it? And they said, well, what about all the gases that was coming from the landfills? Right? So this plant, you can pull this plant at your landfill 
hook it up and take the material that's in that landfill and bring it back and run it right back through and eliminate the landfill. Yes. But the place down in, in Florida, they're, they're, they're crying now because of all the smell and everything that's going on. But if you had the Phoenix there, you could load it up, take it to another place, put it in another place, and start your whole process over again. Well, if that's not the right place, when you pay, they pay $670 million for that incinerator. So if you, take, if you take this seven dollars $800,000 plant and you don't like it, you don't like it right here, move it over here. You don't like it there, move it over there. If you pay $670 million for something, you're not moving it. You're stuck with it. Plus, this, this unit will also, remember the Ebola outbreak a couple, two, three years ago? That unit had been developed then, could have been pulled right into it and gotten rid of that. They can put all the Ebola, all the Ebola contaminated stuff right into it, and it's gone. It destroys it. We just need to, we just need to, anybody that has got a problem with anything, we just need to sit down with them. We work our side, work that side, and try to do everything we can to fix the problem. Not cause a problem, but fix the problem. Is Johnson Industry partner, partner in the No, 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 no. They're just they're just built. That's it. Yeah. We don't have no we have no partners, none whatsoever. We are what we are. What you see here pretty much is here. We've got some other people in place, but what you see is what you get. And you know, Johnson Industry building building What'd you say? Johnson Industry at the place there in the in the hall. You know where they're at? That's where everything's going to be built. Yeah. And the plant that will be built in Jenkins will be there, operable. That anybody wants to come look at it anytime. Yep. So. Now, are these uh, plants like uh, these mobile plants like a built-to-order kind of? Uh, yes. No, no, no. Well, they can be. They, they can, can be. be. Yes. Customized. Yes. Yes. How you want them? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. But now the size. Depending on what you're. The doing. size is the size. Yeah, it's the size. It has to be. It has to be that distance. But the generators don't have to be on there. The generators are to go to a place. A mobile, you have to keep it at a certain. All you have to do is generate the power into it one time. Then when you get it generated up, it will generate enough power, power to feed yeah, itself yeah, right back. Itself, yeah. The same unit that we've got during, let's say, when we had the tornado to hit down here, all of the debris that's left over could be fed through this to produce power and get rid of the debris. Listen, let me tell you what a big problem we got. Last weekend, a truck come through Jenkins, come down the hill, turn off going towards Whitesburg, and flipped over. Yep. That 18-wheeler had nothing in it chicken. but chicken back. That's all it had in it. But guess what? Because that chicken back touched the ground, the EPA said it has to come to Ashland down to the disposable place. Now, if this plant is in Jenkins, only thing they had to do was break it one mile up and dump the stuff in the plant. But somebody had to pay thousands and thousands of dollars to have chicken back. And this unit can removed. also be made as, there's a larger unit that is still portable and it is actually three trailers. Yeah. Okay. Because depending upon what you need, we engineer. Supply and need. cut you all off. Okay. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. Um, I know everybody's getting ready to, to head out, and I wanted to I wanted to thank Chris and, and her uh, her partners for coming and letting us know about this. Get online, look at this information, think about it, share this information with people. Maybe this is not your town's their their town's answer, your town's answer, but it's somebody's answer. Yeah. And the only way we we're going to fix problems is if we keep yeah. trying to address them. Yes, yeah. absolutely. So, um, real quick, let me uh, for you, those of you who do not know who Danny is. Danny Price is uh, our Johnson County Jeep Club, and they're everywhere. They're everywhere. They're in Pike County. They're in Floyd County. They're everywhere. Y'all in Lawrence County yet? Yeah. Well, they're in Lawrence County. They're doing all kinds of good stuff. Get on their Facebook page and check out what they're doing because these are good community civic partners, and we're blessed to have them as Trail Town partners too. We have a, a the first ever Johnson County Jeep Jam. Wow. Coming up on June 8th, 9th, and 10th. This is a three day event. The big events down in that you all go to in Tennessee, how many people how many people did that bring in? Seven thousand Jeeps last year. Seven thousand Jeeps. Oh Unreal. So 
do some wow. mental math here. What's the economic impact of having yeah, a jail? That's, <laughs> that's, that's, awesome. that's the economic awesome. impact. Coming up, we have April the 10th, Trail Town Summit at Moorhead. Anybody that wants to go to this summit, everybody from the state will be there. Come or send me a message to see how you can come and go. Everybody's welcome. It's a great place to network. It's a great place to get your ideas out right. there for things that you're interested in. It's a very good place for Jeepers. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're interested, send me a message. April 14th, Tidy the Trail. We have 75 people signed up now to participate in Tidy the Trail. We're doing the Tidy Trail teams like we did last year, making a competition out of it. So if you've got a little team that wants to get together, pick up some garbage and tie the colorful ribbon on it, we'll have, we'll have some good giveaways. April the 29th is going to be our first Trail Town hike of the year, and that's Hike in the ODC. That's the outdoor classroom. May 12th, first laid back on the lake. You get to come out and kayak. We're going to have a kayak race out to the island and back. We have already had a kayak donated to raffle off. So come out and take your chance at winning you a kayak. And it sets good. It's one of them that don't make you button up. I like it. Um, and then Johnson County Jeep Jam. And get on their page and find out what they're doing because they have all kinds of cool stuff going on. We actually got a ride this weekend, don't you? Yeah, we do. We have the Scotty Hamilton Memorial Ride. If everybody shows up that has says they're coming, we'll have 154 Jeeps. Good. Woo! That will lead here. Go up uh, 321, pick up Route 3, hit 645, pick up 40 through uh, Martin County, go up 292. All the way through to South Williamson, pick up uh, 119 there, come down to Town Mountain Road in Pikeville. We'll go around town and make a, a, a loop through their what they call their parade run and wind up over at uh, Pikeville uh, City Police Department where we're going to do a presentation of all proceeds. And we have a, a really nice gift for the widow of uh, Officer awesome. Hamilton. That's That's awesome. Awesome. Yeah. With 154 Jeeps for that event, I'm hoping we can really blow it out of the water with Jeep Jam. I think we can with Jeep Jam. We've got two bands playing Friday night. We've got how many vendors are signed up now? Let me tell you, I've had you acquire the campus of both Johnson Central and Johnson County Middle School for vendors. For vendors and for events that is planned how for that, that Friday and, and Saturday. And Saturday, Saturday they do their poker run. Yeah. And it's pretty impressive. The first one they did was pretty impressive. This one's going to yes. be. Yeah, we, did, we do a poker run in KSP Trooper Island. Yeah. And last year we raised a little over $4,000. That's great. So yeah, this that year is, we're that's hoping fun. to double it. Now, the, the Friday event, we're going to have everything from the Jeep show to obstacle course to balance boards uh, to uh, drop the top contest. It's going to be all kinds of fun, and even for the little kids, because we're so family oriented, we're going to do the Power Wheels Jeeps. I love it. Races with the I babies. Love it. Oh, so it's going to and be. And for those fun. so inclined for music lovers, that night down at Pain Creek Park on um, Friday night, we'll have uh, two two really good bands. <laughs> and that's our Trail Town Fun Riders to come out and help us uh, help us make some money so that we can keep doing the things we're doing. There'll also be um, a barbecue pull up from our partners in Martin County. We'll be there with their barbecue wagon. And if you ain't never mm. eaten it, there's some good stuff. Yeah, that'll make you lose your diet. <coughs> yep. yep. Um, pick a number between 1 and six. 20. Okay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> number 6. Thank you. <laughs> uh, let's see. Count down six people and tell me who you got, Miss Arnaz. <laughs> Kevin Horn. That's Kevin Horn. Yep. Woo! Yeah. What do we win? What do we win? Hey, we got it. Okay. <laughs> Bloom, where you planted, man? Thank uh, you. Okay, Danny, uh, pick a number 2120. 12. Miss Inez, who we got? Kay Hall, she's not here. Pick another one. Dad going. Thirteen. Thirteen. Uh, let's see. Gary Kessel. Not here. He's already went home. Okay, too bad for him. Two. <laughs> I didn't see him. Tyler Rabbit. <laughs> that would be two. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tyler, in case y'all don't know, he's here on uh, behalf of, uh, of of the mayor from Cold Village. Oh, cool. 
And um, so he's here representing their bunch tonight, and they signed the, the compact. Open it up because you're going to love it. Okay. Are you here <laughs> on behalf of. Uh, oh, sorry, buddy. Andrew? Yeah. yeah. Can I have yeah. Andrew? Andrew is on this. He's my boy. He's my boy. He's my son from another mother. You can get a picture of that. 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 You can get a picture of um, just okay. Next meeting. Uh, I've got a 1988 bottle. 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 I've got a the bottle. i have got a i have got a i have got a i Recreation Authority is going to be joining us, so come and be with us and, be, and find out all the cool stuff going on in Kentucky that's uh, that's rebuilding our post-coal economy. Yeah. Thank you all. I appreciate you so much.